Hello, and welcome to Public Key, the podcast from Chainalysis. This is your host, Ian Andrews. Thanks for all the kind words about our new look for season two. Keep the messages coming. You can find me at Ian Andrews DC or at Chainalysis on either X or LinkedIn. If you're a frequent listener to the podcast, you'll have heard conversations with new and exciting Layer 1 and Layer 2 blockchains. For example, Ironfish, who joined us on Episode 72, are aiming to improve security and privacy of transactions. Or Celestia, who joined us on Episode 30, and they're focused on enabling creation of modular and app-specific blockchains. All of this cool technology creates another problem, though. We're actually creating islands of users and digital assets that we likely will want to move between chains at some point. And today, the security, accuracy, reliability of existing cross-chain technology, it just continues to keep me up at night. So in this episode, I get to speak with Kamal El Mujahid, who is Chief Product Officer at Chainlink. They're building a solution to this problem that they call the Cross-Chain Interoperability Protocol. Kamal believes that CCIP will not only solve for the user who wants to move tokens from, say, Ethereum to Tron, but actually unlock the potential for real-world assets to start moving on-chain. We talk about the origins of Chainlink technology, which was started to bridge off-chain data into smart contracts in a reliable and low-trust way, and how that's paved the way for this new generation of bridge technology that could remake the current experience of islands of digital assets into one incredibly connected world. Last thing before we start the conversation with Kamal, my attention the last few weeks has been consumed by the war in Israel and the heartbreaking loss of human lives. Following the horrific terrorist attack by Hamas in Israel, we've received many questions about how terrorist groups, including Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad are leveraging cryptocurrency. Our priority is supporting our customers in Israel and around the world who are working to disrupt, freeze, and seize assets that may be used to fund terrorist activities. But we also believe it's useful to share an accurate understanding of how terrorist groups are using cryptocurrency. If you head to the show notes, you can find a link to our most recent blog on this topic. Today, I'm joined by Kamal El Mujahid, who is Chief Product Officer at Chainlink Labs. Kamal, welcome to the program. Hey, Ian. Thank you for having me. Kamal, I'm fascinated by your background. I know so many people right now that are rushing into the artificial intelligence space, and you've actually gone the other direction. You spent a number of years prior to Chainlink leading the TensorFlow product team at Google, but you're now product at Chainlink. I'd love to hear a little bit about your your career journey and what led you into this, this world of crypto. Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, so I think for me, the big aha moment, I think we all had our different moments with crypto or Web3. For me, the big moment was when the EVM came out. That really felt like something completely new. And what are those big moments? Like internet was a big moment, right? You could could get instant distribution for your content, your services. Mobile was a big moment because as a developer, you could create something that could be in the hands of everyone with connectivity and sensors. AI, definitely a big moment because now your apps are smart. But the fact that you could build some Thing as a developer that could not be shut down, that could not cheat. You would write the code and it would run as is. So you get Im- immediate instant trust from everyone that your service will run as expected. And that could carry massive amount of value. Those three things put together felt something radically, radically new. And that was going to transform pretty much everything that we see around us. So that was the first big moment for me. And I've always been looking at this industry and, and wanting to, to learn learn more and to get in. I've been playing with smart contracts for, for a while. And I think a couple of years ago, I could really see the acceleration of the adoption of the ecosystem. And it went from this phase of very innovative, but sort of trying to find its place in the world to the phase where it starts being adopted more by traditional institutions and, and, and just before it goes mainstream. So that's what got me in the space. Based on what you just described, you know, the, the rise of the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, and with it, the creation of programmatic money or value transfers, that really started back in 2015, 2016. So you're you're watching that happen while you're you're busy at work in the, the world of TensorFlow. Were you writing code on the EVM? Were you building smart contracts? Like what was your level of, of activity before joining Chainlink into the crypto ecosystem? 
I was definitely playing with Solidity, seeing yeah. what the technology could do. I've had the privilege to witness a lot of those those waves, AI before messaging, and it gave me a good feel of how mature a technology is for a massive developer adoption. And so I was just getting, trying those tools. I could see how sometimes they were very early. And, and that's what I meant by, uh, I sensed an acceleration a couple of years ago yeah. of yeah. maturity of tooling. And I think it's also when Chainlink became very apparently to me, this missing piece because every use case that I could think about that a, a real world use case that had real world value needed some connection with Web2 data or Web2 systems or AI systems. And so this incredibly exciting new primitive, the smart contract, they were just not connected. So their power was really limited to the virtual machine. And the idea that you could connect them with any Web2 system or you could connect them across many of those virtual machines that, that constitutes the, the various chain became very, very obvious to me that was the biggest unlock in that space. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I think probably for a subset of listeners of this podcast, they're intimately familiar with, with Chainlink. I imagine we've got a you know more than a few of your customers talking on the podcast. But I, I also feel like sometimes Chainlink you know, flies a little bit below the radar and that you're an infrastructure technology, right? Can you give us the high level perspective on the portfolio Chainlink has built? Sure. So, so Chainlink solves the connectivity problem. So as I mentioned, those new primitives, those smart contracts, they have these incredible properties, but they're limited in that they're not connected to Web2 data or Web2 computation or Web2 system. That's limitation number one. And limitation number two is they're not connected with each other. Those chains are not natively compatible with each other. And so that prevents a lot of really interesting things. So there is this need for a connectivity layer, a connectivity standard, and this is what Chainlink provides. It offers developers with a very simple way to build those apps that are composed by those mix and matching those heterogeneous systems. And the first really big use case that really gave birth to DeFi Summer is taking a, a DeFi smart contract and connecting it with a price feed of a crypto asset. And this is what Chainlink was originally and, and still known for, I would say probably outside of the industry as the standard for delivering data for DeFi. But very quickly, the same technology, the same connectivity technology started getting used for other use cases. Randomness to power gaming and NFTs. As a consumer, you want to be interacting with something which randomness is fair. It's provably fair. And so that's that's what Chainlink provides. Automation was another really important primitive. You want to certain conditions to be executed at certain time or at certain price points, then you need Chainlink automation. And more recently, Functions, which we uh, launched at Denver, CCIP, which we launched in Paris, which is the cross-chain interoperability protocol, loyalty Oracle. So Chainlink has expanded into this pretty massive platform with three main primitives, data, compute, and then cross-chain CCIP. Yeah, I think the thing that's always struck me about Chainlink is it's data combined with trust that's so powerful, right? It's it's not, oh yeah, I looked up the price of this asset three hours ago and it looked good in the thing that I looked at and you can just trust me. You've built a network that employs a lot of the same fundamental principles as the blockchain itself in order to deliver information that often originates in the real world or in a system disconnected from the runtime layer of the smart contract into that smart contract and able to extend the functionality or build more complex systems. Would you agree, disagree with that? Like that's been my take as an outsider. So I think at the heart of the Chainlink platform is the, the notion of the Oracle, right? And yeah. the Oracle is something that, that connects a smart contract with a Web2 system. Typically, it could be to get a data point, but it could be also be to execute something. You can imagine, I think we had someone at a hackathon that opened the Tesla via a smart contract. So <laughs> you can imagine that it actually enacts some action on the world. Then we've seen with function people sending messages via Twilio. You can also process satellite imagery and, and detect whether there's a, there's a forest somewhere and issue a carbon credit based on that information. So this idea can really be generalized, but at the heart of it, there's this, this Oracle. And what's really specific about, about Chainlink is that those Oracles are assembled in decentralized networks, decentralized Oracle networks. And by using Chainlink as this platform is you're not relying on one Oracle and you don't have to trust one Oracle to do 
the right thing or to not be down. You have this network that have to come to consensus. In the case of a data point, your DeFi protocol, you're securing billions of dollars of a position and there's the liquidation condition. If the price of Ether in US dollar goes below a certain number, then you have to liquidate. You really wanna make sure that this price point is good, right, is accurate. And this is where the fact that this network of Oracle that will all go get different data points and come to consensus over the value of that data point gives you that really nice property of security and reliability. And this is why Chainlink is really known as the standard uh, in the industry for those properties. And from that basis, you've expanded quite a bit. And one of the things you mentioned just a moment ago was this CCIP that was announced earlier in the summer. I think it's now live on mainnet. Cross-chain interoperability protocol. What is that? Why do we need it? What's it going to do for people? Yeah, so what's happening is that we're in an increasingly multi-chain world. There are new chains popping up every day with new interesting properties because the space is exploring, let's get uh, more throughput, let's get uh, lower latency, let's get more flexibility, let's get more programmability, let's have app chains, let's have subnets, let's let you not have to share the bandwidth with other, so, which is a very natural phenomenon in, in, in expanding from the initial point of the industry. But, but as, a, as a consequence, you have this massively heterogeneous space an increasingly heterogeneous space. And those different chains are just not compatible. They're not good at talking with each other, especially in a trust, minimized, secure way. And this creates huge problems. So first, liquidity is fragmented. You have liquidity pockets in one chain, can't be reused in another one. So you have some position in chain A, you want to use it as a collateral to borrow on chain B, you, you can't do it efficiently. That's problem number one. Problem number two is this is much, much bigger than just DeFi and Web3. If you look at TradFi, there are $900 trillion worth of assets that are just waiting to be tokenized. The tokenization trend is happening. It's, it's uh, fueled by very, very strong factors, like putting an asset on chain just increases its utility and, and value tremendously. It reduces costs. So all TradFi institutions, they're looking at how to put assets on chain. But the fact that those chains don't talk with each other means that they're gonna move an asset on chain and it's gonna tr be trapped on, on one chain. So why would you put an asset on chain if it can't move freely? So that's, that's also another really big problem for this industry to be fragmented. And the third one, which is maybe even a little higher level, is that if you look at the web, the web really grew because it was composable. Because as a developer, you could use what another developer that you don't know from Adam or Eve did somewhere and then you can just compose those things and build something even better. But if you have systems that are fragmented, you cannot compose things. As a developer, I cannot mix and match best of you know, chain A with chain B. We were talking about AI before. As an AI developer, I can reuse a model that's been built by people that I, that, are, that I don't even know that I went and picked up on, on Hugging Face. So those are huge problems, and this is why we set on to build CCAP. The way we went about it is, it's not just a technology problem, it's creating a standard. What we want to do is we want to create something that everybody uses, and the more people uses it, the more powerful it becomes. Because the value of, of an interoperability protocol is really lies in the size of the community that uses it. And so we set on to, to create a standard. And the first property of the standard is security. We talk about security all the time because it's the name of the game. That is what brought us to the position that we're in. That, that's what enabled our users and customers and clients to be successful. So this is always going to be front and center. There's been a lot of hacks in the cross-chain space and bridges, I think close to $2 billion stolen last year. Easily. Th this is actually one of the topics I really wanted to dig in on with you, because when I looked at CCIP, it seems to be an alternative to bridges that exist today, which have been notoriously the most vulnerable points across the crypto ecosystem. And I'm not deep enough in CCIP to really understand how it differs from a bridge or do you use it in conjunction with an existing bridge? Maybe we can go deeper on, on how does it solve some of the security issues that we've seen in the, in the bridge layer of the architecture? Sure. It's a radically different approach. And again, it goes back to this usage of these oracles and using them in networks, decentralized networks, right? So you have this very strong, uh, reliable, trust-minimized glue, if you will, between two heterogeneous systems. This is very different uh, than how bridges are traditionally designed. The other uh, very big difference with CCIP is that we use defense in depth. We have different layers of protection. The risk uh, management network, 
that sits on top of the, the actual infrastructure that, that passes the messaging. So you have multiple layers of checks that make sure that the information that has been passed from chain A and chain B is legitimate. And so I think, again, the, the design of the system, and this is something that our world-class research and security team has been working on for the past three, uh, three to four years. So it's also why we wanted to spend so much time testing it uh, with our partners before we, we went uh, live last July. So it is something that, A, is deeply secure and this is something that we we've brought the same the same infrastructure the same decentralized oracle networks that have processed a trillion dollar worth of value cumulatively is securing the same thing and yeah. the second thing is i mentioned standards we're working with swift 12 of the large banks in the world we've announced something really cool with anz yesterday today with dtcc this is what Creating a standard means we're working with the largest DeFi protocols in the space to create, again, this interoperability language that everybody gets to use to solve the industry's problem. And the last thing is really flexibility. So this is more like the developer platform, product person talking. We need to make this thing seamless to use, seamless to embed. Because at the end of the day, those innovations, they, you know, they go through cycles. And the thing that really makes it go upward is when you can integrate them seamlessly with the existing infrastructure. So it never works to go to an existing player and say, hey, you got to scrap everything because this thing is better. It's always, look, this thing brings you superpowers. This is how you integrate it into your existing stack. And that's also how CCHP has been designed. It's super easy to use, it's super flexible, and matches all the use cases that we've observed. Just to maybe make it a little more practical for people, and then I want to come back to the, the Swift topic in a minute, because I think that's important too. If I have my DAP, let's say it's a DEX, running on Ethereum today, and I decide, hey, these layer two networks are getting really, really popular, and I'd like to have my DEX also available on Polygon and Arbitrum, but I don't want to have to split the kind of liquidity available in my DEX. I don't want my users to be locked on only one chain and kind of really have almost three separate universes. You know, maybe an option is to build my own bridge potentially, but potentially simpler. And it sounds like much more secure path would be to use CCIP. Is that the idea? Yeah, absolutely. I would not advise a dApp developer to build their own bridge. It very much like if you're an app developer, do not rebuild your own cloud. Okay. Right. Just use a cloud, but like focus on the thing that makes your dApp the best. Yeah. And we use proven infrastructure from players who's bread and butter it is to make this infrastructure reliable and scalable and secure etc but yeah you're right that's the idea and that's actually the, the difference between multi-chain and cross-chain right multi-chain means well i have all these chains and i need to be present on all these chains and so i'm going to create a dap on all these chains so if you're on chain a uh, you, you can use my dap but then you go on chain b it's the same dap but it's a completely different environment so imagine like the google docs on mac who was very different than the Google Docs on, on PC, and you couldn't reuse the same docs. That doesn't make sense, right? I remember those battle days, not with Google Docs, but Microsoft Office, where it was very, very different. So the, the analogy carries with it some pain. I, I can appreciate exactly. it there. Exactly. It's a good analogy. <laughs> you know, cross-chain is a much better way to go about this, right? Those apps are cross-chain, they live in the same environment, right? And and those, the liquidity is shared. And again, like you don't have like a Google Docs on Mac and a Google Docs on PC. Yeah. I'm going to stick with that analogy. Sounds like what it. One of the questions I had about this, with bridges that exist in the ecosystem today or, or preceding CCIP, it seems like there's a tension between speed of transfer and security. And I think this exists going layer one to layer two or layer two back to layer one. When you want to withdraw, you're locked up for some period of time. And I think depending on the, the technology and the implementation, it could be days, it could be a week. I sense that a lot of the reason behind that time delay is to ensure that transaction on one side of the two networks that you're trying to move between is is completed with finality or yep. right before you allow it to unlock on the other side. How how does CCIP tackle that problem? Like where do you decide between those two if it is a spectrum in fact? Where do you set the limit? 
Again, go going back to our secure approach, we're very much on the side of the spectrum of waiting for finality on the source chain. So what this means is when the finality is fast, then a transfer is going to be like a couple minutes. But uh, when it's slower, then it could take more time. But again, it goes back to this design choice of if you're going to be using CAP, you really care about the security of either the asset you're transferring or the governance decision that you're sending over to another chain. So we're very much on the side of, uh, of security here. And you just touched on something that I think is actually pretty interesting here. I always think about bridges as being a mechanism to move assets cross chain. But in the blog, which we'll link to, you point out that this could be like voting, for example. Mm -hmm. So if you have a community where your community members are, are operating or holding the governance asset on multiple different chains, you can collect votes on all those chains natively and aggregate them via CCIP back to the, the primary chain. Did I understand that correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think getting back to the notion of, uh, you know, we talked about internet of contracts when we launched CCIP, but if you look, it's this notion of composability. There are a lot of new chains. They're all really good in, in one dimension. Some chains are storage optimized. Some others are, they all make different design choices. And, and the idea is to let you as a developer mix and match and pick the best contract, smart contract or use case on each chain and be able to assemble these. I think this is, this is why for me, it's such a huge unlock for the industry because one, it solves this, this very clear you know, liquidity asset free, uh, moving freely across mm -hmm. multiple chain. By the way, private and public chain is another huge, huge angle, especially for TradFi. So we have all this, um, this value that we are looking to help flow in the industry. And then the other angle is this developer composability idea of you now get to not have to reinvent the wheel. You can just uh, pick a really, I don't know, like a, a smart login plugin somewhere uh, on some chain. You can use a very scalable, low cost chain for a certain transaction for gaming, for example. You could be storing your asset on another chain and just settle at uh, whatever is convenient for you. I think that's the, that really opens up the design space so much. Amazing. You've got a bunch of use cases in the in the blog online about CCIP, but the one that stood out for me was the one that illustrated connection of the SWIFT banking network. Mm -hmm. And for people that don't know, SWIFT is basically this intra-bank network that allows for settlement of funds between, between all the large banking institutions, I think, are connected to SWIFT. It's often referred to as a sort of legacy infrastructure and that it's been around for a long time. But I think more politely, it's a backbone of the global financial system. And it looks like you've brought a number of global financial services firms into this. What are they doing? What's their interest in, uh, in being able to bridge here and how are they using CCIP? So first, what's fantastic for banks and TradFi players in general with, with distributed ledger technology is that they get to move from a world where they had a front office, a middle office, a back office with, with systems that then they have to use to settle their trades with, with other partners who are on different systems. And, and now if they can just represent those assets on a private chain or a public chain, now executing a trade is as simple as one API call. And so it's fast, it's easy, it's more cost effective, it's just like this giant leap forward, right? And that's why they're so interested in, in this technology. By the way, once the asset can move so freely, then this is where its utility becomes increased so much. Anyone can program that asset, you get distribution for that asset, so that asset fundamentally becomes more valuable. So there's a cost-saving operational efficiency angle to this, and then there's just a pure my assets are now more valuable angle to this. So that's why they're so interested in this technology. But what they don't want to do, and which is completely understandable, is to have to deal with the complexity of all the different chains out there and the fact that chain A is not compatible with chain B, etc. And this is where CCIP in particular is so appealing to them because CCIP provides this abstraction layer to the world of blockchain, right? And this is why we're so excited as well to be working with Swift because Swift is that messaging system that's already embedded in all the practices, all the IT system that, that those banks are already using. So this is, how, this is where you can see like putting both together is so powerful, right? Because banks are already using Swift as a messaging system, right? You connect Swift with CCAP, which is this abstraction layer 
to chains. And now all those banks are able to essentially make that API call that I talked about with their existing infrastructure. And that's what's so exciting and powerful about these POCs that we've been working uh, working on with, with Swift. And we've announced the successful transaction by ANZ, which is one of the largest banks in, in Australia. Uh, super exciting. Today, we talked about uh, what DTCC has been able to uh, to accomplish, essentially like minting and, and issuing a bond tokens and compatible with uh, Chilling CCIP and distributing them to with designated test wallets. It's a pretty incredible approach to modernization of the traditional financial system, kind of bringing it forward into the, the world of Web3, which is exciting. One of the other pieces of technology, you mentioned it briefly earlier, uh, and it was actually the spark why I was interested in having you all come on the podcast when you introduced something called Chainlink Functions. Now, prior to my joining Chainalysis, frequent listeners will, will know I was in the world of developer infrastructure and platforms. I was at a company called Pivotal. And as, as I was leaving Pivotal, you know, functions as a service platforms were all the rage. It was the new developer paradigm. It was going to replace containers and virtual machines as the execution layer. Companies like Amazon and Google had introduced entirely new kind of compute layers to support that that model of execution. Cloudflare has kind of jumped into the space with Cloudflare workers. So in that context, like what is Chainlink functions? What, what can a developer do with it? Chaining function solves the problem of connecting your smart contract with any Web2 API you'd like in a trust minimized way, right? There's a very naive way to do this would be, let's just have my smart contract make an API call. And then what happens is you have one single point of failure, it can be compromised, it uh, can be unreliable. And so you lose that, that property of my service is trust minimized, it is decentralized. What function does for you is it creates this connection in a way that is secure and trust minimized. So you can offer your, your users this property of it is a smart contract that, that is extended by Web2 infrastructure in a fully trust minimized way. So let me let me maybe just uh, give, a, give a few examples. I think I mentioned a few things already like the satellite image. So imagine you said, well, I want to issue uh, carbon credits on chain and I want to essentially link it to an image at a given coordinate and know whether there's a forest or not. And that's my ground truth. It's like a, an actual satellite taking the image and then I process it with AI and then I wanna know whether there's a forest or not and then I'll, I'll issue a, a carbon credit on chain. That's one example. Uh, another example, which would be the parametric insurance contract. If it rained during, or sorry, if it didn't rain, during this period, then you're owed a payment. You need to be able to make an API call somewhere, for example, Google Cloud Weather API to, to determine whether there was rain or not during this period. So all these examples, they require these, this connection, this Web2 API call. And that's what Chainlink Function does. And it does it in a very, well, you mentioned it, it's a serverless, it's, it's very much the AWS Lambda model where you say, you know, just give me your code and we'll execute it. You don't know which, which machine is going to run on, etc. but it'll, it'll execute. Here, it's the, same, it's the same idea. You're writing a smart contract and you want to write a piece of code. You want a piece of code with connectivity, with the ability to make an API call to run on those oracles. And we run them for you. So that, that piece of code could be go fetch the, the weather data, could be go fetch my script on AWS that has an AI model behind it. And we've seen developers do pretty incredible things uh, with that. This was, by the way, this was something that was used by 80% of our hackathon winners. We had something called any API before, which was a similar-ish kind of idea, but was really hard to use. So really this is this was our developer community telling us, look, you got to build this for us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was an actually pretty easy, as a product lead, you have 80% of your hackathon winners using something, you know, you got to build that. Thing, right and so when we launched it at eat denver people were incredibly excited with this i had the pleasure of being a judge at the hackathon i was seeing some incredible ideas and i'm really really excited to get this product on mainnet to see people come up with those new ideas and i and i think it's going to massively massively expand the space in terms of what you can come up with these are going to be things that consumers will deeply relate with like i'll give you just one one last example there's this 13 year old hacker whom i met at eat denver and maybe he'll he'll recognize himself if he listens to, to this podcast, whose idea was to, to say, okay, well, I'm going to use the Peloton API and I'm going to commit a hundred bucks that I will hit the Peloton 
every day for the next 30 days. And if I do, then I get my hundred dollars back. If I don't, then it, you know, it goes to charity or something like that. And I thought this, this was, this was a pretty incredible idea of uh, self-commitment and actually having something that the smart contract will just ping the API and decide either you lose your money or you get it back if you actually hit the Peloton every day. <laughs> I love that. That is very close to home. I have a Peloton that is currently collecting a little bit of dust in the basement. I've been running more than I've been cycling these last last few summer months. I'm curious, like from a practical standpoint, what do I have to learn or know to use Chainlink functions? Like, is it is it a different programming language? Is it dependent on the API I'm connecting to? Is it Solidity because it's a smart contract? How do I approach it as a developer? It's super easy. It's JavaScript. Yeah. So if you know how to write a Lambda function, yep. it's pure JavaScript, right? So Great. you say, and you know, you use the, the fetch API to go get data from whichever endpoint you're interested in. And then you can transform the data back to make it suitable to what the return value that your smart contract is going to, to consume. So there's your Solidity code, which is you writing your smart contract. And at some point you just say, well, execute my function. And then yeah. that is just JavaScript code. And how does the connectivity work between my smart contract, which is Solidity deployed on the Ethereum network? Like, where is that fetch request that I've written actually running? That's on the Chainlink network? That's on the oracles. So this is where the oracles are not just data pass-throughs anymore. They're actually delivering distributed compute for you. And they're coming to consensus over the results of that compute. This is the general direction that the, the Chainlink platform is taking, right? Starting from you need the price of ETH in USD to uh, now you get to ask for some compute to be executed. Uh, with connectivity to having cross-chain interoperability, messaging, and, and asset transfer. That seems incredibly powerful. To me, it sounds a lot like the Cloudflare evolution as well, where initially they were a CDN. Here's static data that I can serve all around the world really fast out at the edge to now I've got compute alongside that so I can have dynamic data, not just static data being served. And then obviously connectivity kind of to everything. So the, the model coming from a Web2 infrastructure world seems, seems very familiar. What's the timeline? So you've announced it, you've taken it through a hackathon. It's available today on Testnet. When when should we expect to see it on mainnet? Soon. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're not ready to give us a date right now? Working on okay. it. Okay, working uh, on it. This is something that I'm very excited about. I think this is going to open some really, really great use cases. And also, we've talked about AI. When we released it on Testnet, I did a demo with a friend, Lawrence Mooney, who's AI lead at Google, and we had a smart contract generate art with DALI. You start seeing how now with a smart contract, you can essentially leverage LLMs as well and do some Gen AI. We're working on it and it's coming soon. That's exciting. I, I guess uh, people are going to need to follow along maybe the, the SmartCon event that you have coming up in a few weeks in Barcelona to hear more about that. I want to shift topics a little bit from the technology and, and talk a bit about it. It seems like you as a company have done an incredible job pulling some big name financial services institutions into the world of Web3, right? The announcement with DTCC this week, and you talked about the work with ANZ Bank in Australia. Like when you zoom out a little bit from those particular institutions, institutions, like what's your sense of traditional finance and their appetite to be in the world of, of Web3 and, and cryptocurrency? You know, is it is it hesitation? Is it eagerness? Where, where would you rate that right now? Oh, I, I think the the interest for, for distributed ledger technology is very high. And we touch upon the, those those motivations, right? Yeah. Because again, it's it's this uh, operation efficiency, asset utility. So I think that there's a lot of activity in the space. And that's why we're so excited to be working with with Swift and all those, those players, because what they don't want to have to deal with is the complexity of yeah. all the different chains and the fact that we offer an abstraction layer and an interoperable protocol that we can essentially process any command they send to any chain, whether it's private or public, is extremely exciting to them. It's really powerful. Maybe to wrap up our discussion, you know, one last question, and where do you see things going over the next 12 months? And, and maybe preview for us uh, if there's some big announcements coming at, uh, at SmartCon. Like, what's on the horizon? You've obviously had a huge year with some big technology introductions, but I, I always like to look to the future and see what's coming next. Yeah, so look, the, the three big bets for us this year are uh, low-latency oracles targeted at the derivatives market, CCIP, 
and functions. And so we're dead set on, you know, ex heads down, executing against those. They're incredibly exciting. We're seeing phenomenal feedback from our test users. And so this is really what's, uh, what's top of mind for us this year. And yeah, you should definitely, definitely follow SmartCon. We are working very hard to make it a phenomenal event for, for the community and for uh, the industry at large. And again, we're very, very lucky to be working with phenomenal uh, partners. Now, if I take a step back, I think there are three things that are massively expanding the space that I think are, are going to accelerate in the next 12 months. The first one we touched a bit on upon that is re real world assets. Ultimately, you put more value in those systems and more exciting things will happen, right? You know, there was the chat GPT moment for, for AI. I'm thinking about what's the chat GPT moment for Web3. Uh, maybe it's going to be Oh, I just bought a house. You know, I, I just raised yeah. money in two minutes and bought a house with this app. Maybe that's the moment where everybody realizes, holy crap, that's Web3. I can buy a house. <laughs> so that comes from putting more assets on chain. And that's accelerating. And we, we talked about that. The second thing is real world data. For now, it's been a lot financial data and, and crypto prices data. But with something like functions, I'm really keen to see what kind of data gets put on chain. It could be sports data. I don't know if you follow the Rugby World Cup, but I, I do follow it. Like who won which game should be on chain for people to do exciting things uh, about that. So we talked about satellite imagery, be any sort of data. Putting more data on chain will lead to more exciting use cases. And, and the last one is uh, what I like to call real world users. What I mean by this is users who don't know or care what a private key is and they just want to interact with this new world via interfaces that they understand and i think things like uh, account abstraction social login social recovery are going to be incredibly powerful to bring more people in in the industry and by the way um chain link's playing in in all three of those <laughs> but not um, surprising if i take a step back those are the three big trends i think that will massively unlock or bring this this industry to the next level in the next 12 to 18 months. Let's just give it 12 to 18 months. I love the outlook. I agree on all three points. Those are going to be massive movers for the ecosystem. And uh, best of luck to Team France in the Rugby World Cup. They opened with a, an amazing defeat uh, at home over the, the New Zealand All Blacks, which, uh, which I think people were very excited about. I don't want to drink it, you know, I don't want to drink it. You know, this was, you know, I want to stay very, very cautious about this. <laughs> well, it's going to be fun to watch the, the remainder of the tournament play out. Best of luck to your team in, in that tournament. Kamal, thanks so much for joining us today. It was a terrific conversation. Thank you for having me. Hey there. Thanks for listening to another episode. Our team has been working hard to make our content available on all the major platforms. So right now, take out your phone and head to your favorite social media app. You can subscribe to Chainalysis on TikTok, visit us on YouTube, sign up for our LinkedIn newsletter, and of course, follow us on Twitter or Telegram. Just search for at Chainalysis. Now, last thing before we go, on October 18th, the U.S. Department of Treasury announced that it imposed sanctions on 10 Hamas members, operatives, and financial facilitators, including a Gaza-based money services business called Buy Cash Money and Money Transfer Company. Buy Cash has been used to transfer funds by affiliates of terrorist groups, including Hamas, Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic State, or ISIS, in addition to facilitating cryptocurrency fundraising efforts for Hamas. The actions by OFAC aim to disrupt Hamas's revenue sources in the West Bank, Gaza, and elsewhere. In addition to buy cash, these sanctioned include individuals involved in a secret Hamas investment portfolio and an operative with deep ties to the Iranian regime and its proxies. To better understand the recent sanctions announcement, head down to the show notes. You can find a link to our recent blog and the OFAC sanction announcement.